Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to those of you who are online uh, on Facebook. Welcome to everyone who is in the room here at, at Sandy Park. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Johnson. I'm a GP uh, based in Newton Abbott, uh, and I'm also the clinical chair of NHS Devon uh, CCG. Uh, today, uh, for this next hour or so, what I want us to do is to... Sorry, we were having me being echoed back just a few seconds after I'd said it, and we could end up in an eternal loop, which could be quite um, uncomfortable for some. Um, uh, what we want to do over the course of, uh, of this evening is talk a little bit about who we are as a CCG. What is a CCG? What is our purpose within the health system uh, in Devon? The process that we went through to be coming uh, from two CCGs into one uh, earlier this year, some of those things that actually are real key successes and achievements, how we brought our staff together so that we knew those values uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the vision that we would work towards and show you how we celebrated using those values and visions in, in, in developing some really good things that I think have benefited you uh, as our public, as the population of Devon. Uh, when we look at some of those celebrations, we're then going to focus on some of those, I think, that are the really key things that have made a difference to, uh, to you, uh, particularly around how we have engaged with you and how you have engaged with us. Um, we'll pick up a little bit about the success that we've had uh, in some of our vaccination programmes and pick up particularly around flu vaccines. Uh, and talk a little bit about primary care um, and how we see primary care working at the moment here in Devon. Many of you will know that NHS England produced their long-term plan, uh, which showed what are the aspirations of the NHS in England over the next five years and the funding that is associated with that. And our job here in Devon is to work out what does that mean for our population, and we need to respond to that. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're responding to that and how you're helping us develop that response. What I think is really important is an opportunity for, for you to ask any questions related to that or anything that you want to ask us. Uh, there are different ways of being able to do that. We have had some uh, questions that have been submitted to us already and we all do our best to cover those. Uh, people here in the room, uh, you can raise your hands when we get to the questions and we do have a microphone going around. And then those of you who are on Facebook, uh, if you can use, uh, switch over to the other social media, to Twitter, and use hashtag NHSDevonCCGAGM, uh, and you can submit your questions that way. You can also, of course, do that in the room here if you'd rather do it that way rather than raising your hand. But we will have enough time for as many questions as we can. And if we can't answer them, we will then take them away and make sure we get those answers back to you. So first of all, who we are? Who is this CCG, this Clinical Commissioning Group? Well, I think it's probably easiest to say that we're the, we're the local headquarters for the NHS here in Devon. Uh, since becoming a single organisation over, over the whole county, we're the fifth largest in the country. We've been entrusted with £1.8 billion of taxpayers' money uh, and charged with spending that wisely to deliver the best health care we can for the 1.2 million people here in Devon. Uh, we are uh, described as a clinically-led organisation. That was where the clinical bit of CCGs came from. And that means that we have GPs and nurses and hospital consultants and other healthcare specialists within our organisation and particularly within our governing body, making sure that the decisions we make not only are using the right, you know, using our finances in a sensible way and we are stewards of that purse, but also that we are making the best decisions in the health and the care that we provide for our population. So what are those things that we do? So we make sure that we commission the services within our hospitals or within the community or with our GPs so that the services that you get are the best that we can try and get them to be. And so whether you're there and you're having a hip replacement, whether you're on a trip to A&E, or at the birth of your baby, we're responsible for those healthcare services that you or your friends or your family receive. 
On the 1st of April this year, we became a single CCG from the two CCGs that came before, which was South Devon and Tor A CCG, and new North East and West Devon CCG. And for us, that was a, a really important step because it means that we can work much more closely with all of our four key hospitals and with our three local authorities uh, to make sure that we integrate with them and we make sure that health services and care services, hospital and community services are knitted as closely together as possible. Our CCGs have been in existence for, well, just over six years now. Um, and over that time, we've commissioned £9 billion worth of health services for the people of Devon. When we launched our uh, uh, Devon CCG, we gave our staff the opportunity to reflect on what are the highlights over those last six years. What are those key achievements? And I'd like to show you a short video now, which, uh, which just touches on some of those. <laughs> Over the past six years, Devon's CCGs have been responsible for the planning and buying of £9 billion worth of health services for the 1.2 million people who live in Devon. In that time, the NHS in Devon delivered 60,000 babies. GPs carried out 20 million consultations. 30 million health appointments and treatments took place, including 2.5 million in A&E, a quarter of a million for cancer, and one and a half million for mental health conditions. Our 111 service answered 1.8 million calls. Ambulance teams attended to 800,000 emergencies and community teams made six million visits to people at home. Working as part of our health and care system, our 500 staff have reshaped care, helped people stay well, given children the best start and supported people to look after themselves in strengthened communities. Everyone in Devon can use digital technology to book appointments, order repeat prescriptions and access a health record. While to date more than half a million people can already consult with their GP online, making a better use of our resources and improving the service for patients. 87% of our GP practices now use electronic prescribing, enabling people to get medicines they need more quickly and easily. Our formerly and referral website and app provides drug treatment and referral advice for healthcare professionals. It receives more than 1 million page views a year and was a finalist in the 2015 HSJ Awards. Following consultations with 4,000 people across Devon as part of Your Future Care and Into the Future, we reinvested staff and resources from hospitals into communities. In Eastern Devon alone, community teams now make more than 17,000 home visits a month, while since 2015, Torbay's Integrated Care Organisation has seen and treated 1.5 million people in their own homes. Integration in Plymouth led to a number of health and wellbeing hubs opening across the city, providing health, housing and education support to thousands of local people. I commend Plymouth for its leadership. You're setting an example, not only that you're aiming to roll out across the whole direction of the city with the other hubs, but also an example that many other parts of the country, I think, will want to learn from and emulate. Congratulations. In Holsworthy, more than a thousand people are involved in pioneering work to develop health and social care services for the future. Similar projects are underway across Devon. After a half a million pound investment, a new Bodley Hub now provides health and wellbeing services to more than 50,000 local people. The Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Matt Hancock, visited the Hub and was inspired by the range of services. Working as a system, we ran a number of successful campaigns. Our Thumbs Up for Kobe campaign encouraged parents to vaccinate their children against flu. You don't want anything like this happening to you or anybody else that you know. So, yeah, we would urge you to get the flu jab. It's very important and um, Kobe was very special to everybody. Our campaign reached more than one million people across the country and increased flu vaccinations for two to three year olds by 10%. We referred 1.8 million people from their GP for appointments and treatment, enabling 900,000 operations, including heart, spinal and cataract surgery to take place. 
As a system, in the past year we attracted 50 million of additional national funding to improve urgent care services, enhance mental health provision and boost diagnostic testing. In 2017, thousands of people joined us to celebrate the 70th birthday of the NHS at hundreds of events. We've responded to 30,000 MP freedom of information and media inquiries, published 1,000 bulletins and sent 20,000 social media messages. Our patient advice and complaints team dealt with 5,000 questions and feedback and at the same time 2,000 yellow card reports which enables healthcare professionals to raise concerns to improve the patient experience. Devon's new mother and baby unit enables mothers to stay with their babies during treatment, while the soon to be completed psychiatric intensive care unit will mean that rather than travelling long distances, people can receive the specialist care they need here in Devon. The innovative Handy app, which gives parents advice on common childhood illnesses, was used more than 70,000 times. Through the Transforming Care Partnership, we enhance the lives of people with learning disabilities and autism. The past six years have seen significant change in Devon's health and care system as we work with our partners on new ways of providing care to future-proof services for the years ahead. On behalf of our governing body, I'd like to thank everyone who has and continues to work with us, from our staff and our partner organisations, both statutory and voluntary, to our patients, our carers and the public who have shared their insights and experiences with us. The future is exciting. We are the fifth largest CCG in the country with an annual budget of £1.8 billion. Pounds. We look forward to working even more closely together with our partners and our public as we commission services that ensure that people across Devon, from Braunton to Brixham, Plymouth to Paynton and Heartland to Honiton, have access to the right care at the right time and in the right place. Well, I'd hope you'd agree that there are some things for us to celebrate and things for Devon as a whole to celebrate in uh, some of the, uh, the good things that have happened for us in our health uh, and social care. Um, uh, just to welcome anyone who has joined us uh, on Facebook. We have got a number. We've got, we've got uh, 10 people at the moment who are watching us uh, on Facebook. So welcome to you. Uh, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm the chair of the CCG and just talking us through some of the highlights uh, of, uh, of, of the course of the last year or so. Um, also be aware that if you want to contribute, if you have any questions or comments that you want to raise, that if you switch over to Twitter and use the hashtag NHSDevonCCGAGM, then you'll be able to do that and there'll be time for questions afterwards. So when we formed our new CCG, uh, one of the things that was important as we brought these two organisations together was really to be clear in, in our organisation as we work with each other, but also as we work with our key partners and our public, um, what are those values and the vision that underpin what we do? And the best way for us to do that really was to ask our staff, and over 300 of our staff contributed to what you see on the page here. Uh, and, and I think they are some really strong statements that if we follow these, uh, then, then, then that will mean that we stay focused on doing what is the right thing uh, for people. Working together for Devon, that's our vision, and it's not just working together with a person in the next desk or in the next office, it's working together with our hospitals, with our GP practices, with our community teams, our voluntary sector, with our local authorities and with our public and our patients. Uh, the values that we have, we say that we want to operate as one team, that actually we want to respect everyone in that team, and that everything we do, we should strive to do it the best that we can. We should have quality in it all and that everyone has a role in leadership. So that, is, that should dictate how we relate to each other and how we relate to you. And I hope that that, as we continue our relationship with you, our public, our patients, uh, that actually that is, that is borne out in, in, in the conversations and the contacts that we have. The other thing that we have done recently this year is we felt that it was important, as, as highlighted by that video, that there is much to celebrate and a lot of that is due to some really hard work 
by uh, some of our staff. And we took some time out really to celebrate that, to, to, to celebrate some of the things they were doing, particularly if they were having direct and significant impact uh, on, uh, on the services that we provided. We made 25 awards. Um, I, I'm not going to talk you through all of them now, but I think it'd be just nice just to see a highlight of, of some of those awards, and then we'll pick up on some of those themes uh, as we look a, in a little bit more detail about, uh, about some of the projects that will be highlighted here. For me, it's, uh, it's just something that you do all the time, and then somebody recognises that. It's lovely seeing you say the whole of CCG, everybody working together, so brilliant day. It's been buzzing in there. I think everybody's been upbeat and joyous. It's not just the organisation we work with, it's all our providers out in the community and, and all the services that we work and all the vulnerable groups that we work with as well. It's just nice to see so many excited people in the room, you know, genuinely celebrating theirs and other people's success. It feels really sort of friendly, like a family. It felt a bit like a wedding. <laughs> yeah, a good wedding, a good wedding. Today is the first of our Celebrating You staff events where people within the CCG have nominated their colleagues for different categories to say actually that person stands out for me and these are the reasons why. My award is for a lifetime achievement. Slightly embarrassing because it means you've been around a long time. It's just lovely to think that, that people are recognising everything that you've done. I was uh, lucky enough to be uh, nominated and I was winner of recognition of support services and Rebecca and I agreed that uh, actually being uh, nominated was an award in itself so actually to go on and win something was uh, overwhelming. Two awards today which I'm really pleased about, really pleased about. It's a great team effort I have to say, I've got an amazing team working with me so this goes to them as well. So I won the Chair and Chief Exec Award, which was um, a massive shock and um, I feel very honoured um, to, to be acknowledged and to have received that award. Yeah. Nikki has been tireless in the support of everyone, including myself, over a number of years now and this is just fair recognition of the fantastic job that she's done over recently. So I got one of the Director's Awards, which I'm really, really, really um, touched to have received. Yeah, we won the um, Projects of the Year for Hashtag Thumbs Up for Kobe. Really uplifting and great also to hear about what other people are doing across the CCG. Actually now to feel like they're part of an organisation that really cares about staff is really kind of uplifting. Innovation was what I got recognised for, but you don't do that on your own. That's done through teams of people. Amazing, just um, shockingly um, shocked that uh, I was given an award. So today I was nominated and won the lead uh, Leadership Award the CCG with real privilege and honour. So exciting to win an award. I love what I do and I love my team and just being part of this today has just been so great. Today we won the highly commended for uh, the team or project uh, of the year. We did that with vision and values. What was really nice to hear was people talking about each other. So from the moment that people turned up and came to lunch, there was an enthusiasm, there was a buzz in the room, there was good humour and you got a sense that people felt valued. So it felt really good, really positive and a recognition of what's gone on, but also I think that helps people feel valued and really ready to take on the challenges that we face ahead. So I just really, I guess I would just want to reiterate um, within this public meeting my thanks to those staff who work within the CCG. You saw those winners, but those winners behind them were so many other people who had worked hard, who, who had supported them and, and were part of those projects that, that meant that they were able to win those. So my thanks to them um, for all that they do uh, for us as an organisation, but more importantly for, uh, for, for the people we serve here in Devon. Um, one of those things that was the, one of those teams that you saw were our engagement team, and they have done a lot of work in how how we interact uh, with you to make sure that you have that opportunity to understand what we do, to understand the issues that the health system faces, but also to influence and direct uh, what you think we should be doing. Uh, over the course of the year, we engaged with more than 40,000 people. So if you are one of those 40,000, then thank you uh, for, be, for playing your part. 
Uh, we did that with a number of particular projects, particularly around maternity care, around community services, and around urgent and emergency care. NHS England um, actually looked at the work that we were doing, and we have been rated as outstanding uh, in that work, in the way that we engage. And we're only one of, one of only 25 areas in the country to have uh, received that outstanding classification. Uh, so my thanks to the team, um, uh, who many of whom are in the room now, uh, for the work that they do, and my thanks to you for being active participants uh, in that. We have a public engagement panel, uh, and that is set up within the CCG to provide us with assurance and direction for all the engagement uh, and involvement activity. We've got CCG staff that sit on that. We have lay members, and you can see three of those lay members um, have let us put their photos up. That's Carol, Roger, uh, and June. And we also have Healthwatch Devon represented on that panel. Uh, the agendas and summaries of those meetings are available on our website, and if, if, if that's something that's of interest to you, then I would encourage you to, to go and have a look on our website uh, for those. We work really closely with patient participation groups that are linked with GP practices, uh, and also with the three uh, health watches in Devon, uh, Plymouth, uh, and Torbay, and a number of people, uh, uh, welcome a number of people are here from health watch uh, in the room with us at the moment. Uh, the other bit of news that I think is really positive, because often we haven't worked as closely with uh, our local authority colleagues as we could have done in the way that, that we go about uh, this engagement, uh, but a couple of months ago we appointed our first joint engagement role with Devon County Council, so that should help us make sure that we, we work with you in a much more aligned and joined up way than maybe we have done uh, in the past. One of our roles as a CCG is to make sure that we do our best to prevent illnesses that are and should be prevented. Uh, early last year, unfortunately for nine-year-old Kobe, we weren't successful in doing that and he tragically died from flu. Uh, one of his responses of his parents was to say, we don't want this to happen to any other parents. We don't want them to go through what we've been through. And they worked really hard with our comms team to develop a flu campaign called Thumbs Up for Kobe. You heard it mentioned earlier, it's there on the screen. Again, the whole idea of that was to increase the uptake of flu vaccines in young children. We used postcards and social media messages, and we reached more than a million people with this campaign. And that wasn't just restricted with Endeavour, that went beyond. And it did have a big impact. In fact, one and a half thousand more children in Devon got the flu vaccine that year than the previous year. And that's a staggering 12% increase. So I want to thank the, um, the communications team on that. But most importantly, I want to thank Kobe's parents for being prepared to do something that must have been hugely difficult for the benefit of those one and a half thousand children and hopefully many more who will continue to get the vaccine as a result. I'd like to show you a video um, which does outline the campaign and does include Kobe's parents talking to us about why this was so important for them. He was funny, always playing pranks on everybody. Loved running and jumping off things. He fell off the wall once, didn't he? Scraped all up his yeah. front. Well, I didn't exactly enjoy maths, but he used to help me a lot. And every single break um, time, we went and played it with everybody. Before he passed away, uh, I took him to school. He, was, he said he wasn't feeling very well. A couple of hours later, I had a phone call. Went and picked him up. And he was just really groggy. Uh, quiet, which is definitely not like him. Yeah, I took him out um, on the Sunday, took him out for lunch uh, with my parents and that, and same again, didn't eat, weren't really drinking. My doctor diagnosed him with the flu. He was off for a long time, and then that's where I started to think that when's he going to come back, and I started to get worried. And he woke up that evening with really puffy eyes, he was just so drained, so we took him back to a hospital. So we were sent into emergency observations then. And then they were running tests and waiting for him to come back and they just did, didn't know what was wrong with him. And then a few hours after that, he passed away. Mum just told me what he had was the flu. Yeah, I didn't actually believe how many children have 
have passed away from the flu. Didn't think it was that bad. In a meeting, we were listening to the statistics from Public Health England on how low the flu jab was, um, and it had not changed in 10 years. Um, so we just offered if there was anything we could do, and they suggested about the flu campaign. So I would love that for, yeah, maybe not about a school uniform, it probably would someone else, but definitely the hat. I've got quite a few friends that live up country, and they've been seeing it in their pharmacies and stuff like that, so every so often you get like a, a picture. Mm. So it is mad to like know that it, like the postcards are up there and fetch in the box, they put postcards in every one of their deliveries. It feels like a little bit better than knowing that you've got all that support mm. behind you. Yeah. I mean, like people sending in photos of their kids, but they yeah. say the, the hashtag thumbs up and you know they've had it done, they just you know that like you've helped, helped mm. someone else. Yeah. So. They want to like, push it. Um, that we, we spoke about perhaps maybe doing a video. I wouldn't mind coming to a couple of the schools yeah. around the area when, when the, they have their flu jabs this year. Tell me what it's like being at school without Kobe there now. Well, I'm struggling with my maths a lot and not a lot of people play it like they used to. You don't want anything like this happening to you or anybody else that you know. So, yeah, we would urge you to get the flu jab. It's very important and um, Kobe was very special to everybody. It's, uh, I'm sure you'll agree, it's a very touching video. Um, uh, I think the, uh, the success it had is definitely something uh, to be celebrated um, because it really did make a difference um, in trying, us trying to prevent preventable uh, uh, disease that is, that is flu and the tragic consequences that it can have on some people. Primary care in Devon is something to be really proud of. Um, I would like to thank all my GP colleagues um, who work tirelessly to provide that GP service along with their uh, practice nurses, uh, healthcare assistants, their receptionists, because working together, all of our 127 GP practices have either got a rating of outstanding or good uh, given to them by the Care Quality Commission. Uh, and that, is, that, is, that, is, uh, that sets them apart from a lot of areas within the country. Uh, so the CQC, the Care Quality Commission, also uh, rate and inspect social care providers. And we're also celebrating that 86% of those are rated as outstanding or good. We're also leading the way in quite a lot of innovative work happening within primary care. Um, we, uh, in, in Devon, more than 5,500 people consult with their GP via online uh, access, which means that they can get their healthcare advice and treatment more quickly. And that is increasing month on month. This has saved probably, we think, at about 3,000 face-to-face appointments within GP practices. Uh, and not only does that relieve some of the increasing pressure that our GP colleagues are facing, but it also increases the availability of our GP so that when you do need to see your GP face to face, you are much likely, much more likely to be able to have uh, that opportunity. Devon is also the highest user of the NHS app with more than three and a half thousand people having downloaded that uh, and that can be downloaded onto your mobile phone. It enables you to book appointments, to order repeat prescriptions and to view elements of your medical record uh, and I encourage you if you haven't done that already uh, then, uh, then do try that. It does give you a very easy way of accessing some of the services within primary care. Uh, it also helps us as a whole system to be able to be much more efficient and in fact effective in the way that we deliver our primary care services. 
I'd like now to move on to the NHS long-term plan. Uh, just before I do that, I'd like to welcome anyone who has uh, tuned in uh, on Facebook. Uh, we now have 20 people uh, watching uh, online. Uh, welcome, my name is Paul Johnson. I'm the chair of South Devon and Torbay. South, I'm not anymore. I'm chair of Devon CCG because South Devon and Torbay merged with New Devon, as many people saw earlier in the presentation uh, on the 1st of April uh, this year. Um, we are just having a little bit more of the presentations and then there will be time for questions. Uh, and if you do have any questions you want to raise, then if you move over to Twitter and use the hashtag NHSDevonCCGAGM, then you will be able to do that and we will pick those up and do our best to answer them. So the NHS long-term plan. Now many uh, of you may know, and we picked it up earlier, that the NHS produced this long-term plan with their set of aspirations, their requirements for, uh, for local systems and, and the funding that is associated with it. And our role is to work out what does that mean to us in Devon? How do we put that into the context of the needs of our population, the workforce that we have available, the services that we have available, um, and the challenges that we particularly face and we are developing our response to that plan which I hope when it becomes published later uh, in the autumn will see us articulating how we intend support to support people to live healthier lives how we are going to support GP and community services so that we're able to intervene early to support local people how we're going to enhance our services to children and how we're going to help young people and adults uh, when they have mental health needs so that they get the support and the care and recovery that they need. And how are we going to make sure that the hospital services that we have are of the highest quality and that we are providing them in the right place and at the right time when people need them. We do face challenges and we have to be honest about those challenges in order to make sure that we plan our services uh, appropriately. Um, more people are living for longer, which is a cause of celebration, but it also means that we, uh, there are often more requirements of the health service in order to support them, particularly because they are living with more and more long-term conditions. Some preventable illnesses like type 2 diabetes are increasing and the implications that they have and the other illnesses that they predispose people to are also meaning that there is more that we have to do as a health system. And we have to do it in the light of not all of the jobs that we would like filled are being filled and there are vacancies. So there are one in 10 nurses and one in 12 social worker posts remain vacant uh, within Devon. We have celebrated that there is increased funding. Uh, it was, there was some good news in there, but it doesn't keep pace with the increasing needs of our population. And we have to be honest to say that the NHS in Devon does not always provide timely access to care. And I know that one of the written questions that I will pick up later asks us just that. And I'll pick that up in a, in a little while. Also, we are getting more and more people moving into and being born in Devon, and why not? It's a great place to be. So in the next five years, we're going to have an extra Exmouth with 33,000 people moving in to Devon. And not only are we getting more people, but we're getting more people who are over 85. Uh, the number of those people will double in the next 20 years. And with age, as well as being a cause of celebration, also comes that increased uh, incidence and prevalence of, uh, of those long-term conditions that we need to support people through. Uh, in order to help us write that long-term plan so that we get it right for Devon and we accept those challenges, um, we have engaged with more than 4,500 people on a range of topics. And what's really helpful is there are some of the things, and these are some of the highlights that people have told us. People have said that they are willing to travel for specialist care and treatment, but do expect it to be available within their county or certainly within the peninsula. 50% of people who we made contact with said they would consider digital solutions uh, instead of face-to-face -face outpatient appointments. One was quoted as saying that if the level of care is the same, then they don't mind it would be easier, in fact, for them to do that at home rather than travelling. Others have said we need to encourage health and well-being and the importance of it. 
and use social prescribing, which is a means by giving a doctor an, an alternative to traditional medicines that involves support uh, within the community and non-medical solutions to many of the stresses and strains that we face. We do know that people attend A&E because it's easier than accessing other services. People said A&E is often the only thing open and other parts of the system are confusing or not obvious. And another quote was that community support and social interaction is critical to mental illness support and recovery. There are many, many more things that people have said uh, and we're working with, with Healthwatch in pulling that together because during the course of this autumn we want to use what you have told us to help us develop that plan and then we will publish that plan which is our response to NHS England's long-term plan later uh, in the autumn. So we now have... Um, uh, an opportunity to open up to the room to people on, uh, who are watching us on Facebook and to some of those questions that have been asked uh, beforehand. Uh, anything that we have covered or anything that you uh, would like to raise. If I open it up to the room first, and I will keep an eye, I'm looking at my phone, not uh, for, for the pure reason that's where the questions online will come through, and I will pick those up as, as they come. Any questions or comments in the room, first of all? Yes, so the microphone will come to you and then, uh, and then we'll take the question. Okay. Hello, my name's Andrew Beresford. I um, recently become a governor-elect of the rd &E. My term of two years starts next week. And so I'm here partly to understand a bit more about how the whole thing joins together. But one thing that you mentioned earlier uh, in your presentation was the Budley Health and Wellbeing Hub, which, which is in my the community where I, I live. One of the things I've been trying to find out for the last year or so is how it's managed, because it seems to be rather secretive. There's a charity called West Bank that is rather unusual. It doesn't have any meetings in public. It doesn't even have an annual general meeting. Uh, um, but there is a, a, a hub advisory board, which one of your staff I is represented on. And I keep an ask, ask to see minutes of that at that board meeting and so far it's been an absolute silence so I'm hoping that that would improve at some stage. Um, I also wanted to ask a question about um, the relationship between GP practices and foundation trusts because my own GP practice is reluctant to recommend to their patients that they look at the benefits of being a member of the local foundation trust because they regard the rd &E as a competitor. And I'm not sure that's the right way to view the rd &E. Certainly as a governor, I wouldn't like to think that that should be a disadvantage to, to the patients in the community that I, I would serve. Yeah. Uh, and as I, let, I have other things I'd like to ask, but I think it would go on too long. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank All you. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So the first thing to, to pick up on that point around the Budley Hub. So, so, so the Budley Hub was, 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 uh, is a, a, a sort of a health and well-being hub within, within Budley Salterton that was set up to bring um, those sort of community and voluntary services together for that, for that population. We have supported West Bank and we have provided fundings for West Bank for them to establish that. Um, we are currently looking at what that ongoing relationship should be. Um, I can't speak for them as to what, uh, you know, the, the access or not to, to some of their discussions and plans, but the details of what our ongoing relationship will be will be something that we'll, we'll determine um, over the next few months. And what I'll do is I will ask uh, one of, if, we, if you leave your details with one of the team, I'll ask uh, one of our executives to make sure that they keep you linked in with what is happening there. With regards to general practice and foundation trusts, um, if we go, go back um, quite a long way and um, that there was a sense of, uh, of competition between hospitals, between GP practices and between one part of the organisations and the other, um, it's been clear for a long time that that is not a healthy existence and it is not helpful for you as a population or as patients trying to navigate that and experience that. Uh, we've worked really uh, closely with all of our pride providers, including general practice, to try and break down 
any of those misconceptions, any of those relationship boundaries. And we, and, and we are making some progress. We are having elements of success. There is now a GP within um, that East Devon area who works and links in and is working with the RD&E um, as one of their clinical directors. We've got a similar setup within South Devon with Torbay Hospital. So we're, we're bridging those gaps between primary care uh, and secondary care. And the other thing that's come through more recently is that uh, you may know that your GP practice has become part of a primary care network, which is a, a, a new initiative um, uh, that NHS England and the Department of Health have set up. And that's bringing GP practices together so that they are a stronger voice in the system and that their relationship with us as a CCG and with their local hospitals will therefore be strengthened through that. So I think historically you're absolutely right, there have been those sort of tensions. I think we've made some really good inroads and I'm optimistic with the sort of structures that are in place that that uh, will improve. Um, let me, take, uh, uh, let me take a question that was presented to us ahead of time uh, because it does relate to primary care, so I think that's quite helpful. And this is Martin Shaw has submitted this one. And his question was, has the CCG issued any guidance to GPs to restrict specialist referrals or does it have any plans to do so? Um, I think the, the, the honest answer to that is that we have guidelines um, that we have agreed within our CCG. Uh, that allow us to make sure that we spend the money that we have available to us providing the right services and those services that are most important to our patients. Um, and to do that, we issue some guidelines to our GP colleagues on what and when it might be appropriate to refer into secondary care. But we don't just leave it like that. Actually, what we have done, and there are about 35 of these in place, and there will be some more coming through, but they actually also give them alternatives that they can try access to specialist help that isn't a standard referral into hospital and other things that they can try as trials of treatment within their setting that may help patients. And it's all part of making sure that we use our resources as appropriately uh, as we can. Um, another question that has come through, I'll do one that's come through online if I may, and then I'll come back to the room. So we've got a question that says, what savings have you made bringing the two CCGs together? So when we bring two CCGs together, I, I guess you'd appreciate that a lot of those running costs and the, and, um, uh, that, that keep two organisations going, you don't need if you've just got the one. And we have made savings, and we've made about a £4 million worth of savings by bringing those two CCGs together. And that uh, gives us uh, an opportunity, rather than spending that within our organisations, we can pass that as an opportunity onto the frontline staff who are working with our providers to deliver care uh, for, for the population. Um, so we have made savings and we continue to make savings as a CCG and uh, that's one of the requirements from NHS England and year on year we will be driving efficiencies as tightly as we can over, over the coming years. Any more quick questions in the room? Yes sir. Yes. Two things. Um, Every time there's a planning application for a large housing estate, the cry goes up from the general public about doctor's surgeries or the lack of them. Uh, somehow this doesn't seem to quite come together. Is the uh, CCG does it now, I notice, not NHS England, just a subtle difference. Um, is that um, involvement limited to providing the buildings or a site for building GP surgeries? Presumably it's not involved with the day-to-day -day running of any surgeries or subsidising surgeries or anything of that sort? So, so when there are planning applications, and I, and I think you know, that there are, there are going to be a lot of new buildings, we're getting, as, as we quoted earlier, th you know, th you know 33,000 more people coming into, into Devon. That does mean that we have to provide the health care for that population. Um, and if we look at primary care, if we look at general practice surgeries, one of the things that happened um, as of April this year is that we, as a CCG, took over the responsibility of commissioning those services that previously had been done by NHS England. Um, I think one of the advantages of having done that is that local knowledge and those local relationships. So we have a relationship with our local authority colleagues. We know their plans for future development and we are having those conversations with them. Okay, what are the implications for us 
in regards to healthcare, but also what are the opportunities of the funds that they receive from those builders to be used to provide healthcare. So, so we are absolutely having those conversations with them. Um, it's more than just bricks and mortar. Um, our, we, we, we will need to, and we do need to ensure that our GPs get the money that they require to provide the services for the patients. And as they get more patients registering with their practice, we ensure that that income increases to, to, to cover that increase. But, but you're right, we have to not just be reactive when we suddenly realize there's another thousand homes. We need to be actually alongside our local authority colleagues uh, and, and, and working with them to plan that, and, and we are. And that's the, one of the key advantages of us having taken over that commissioning. What you're is very odd, isn't it? There's a great deal of point in complaining to the planning department about the lack of GPs and whether this gets lost in the town hall somewhere. <laughs> So, so I, I, guess, um, I guess at the moment, when it comes to making sure that there, are, there is a GP service, we, c we will do everything we can to make sure that there are enough GPs or enough services being provided, and we will get as much support and as much access to those resources in local authorities for us to be able to do that. Um, we do, as with any area elsewhere in the country, we do have that workforce uh, tension that we have to live with, where where actually there aren't the GPs there um, that there once were, there aren't the practice nurses there that they once were. So we are thinking how can we still care for people within primary care with fewer GPs or, or with fewer GPs given the population increasing and the same with our practice nurses and so on. So, so I don't think that the, the, the town hall or the local authorities are going to solve that, um, but we will certainly be making it aware to them that that is something that needs to be taken into account, yes. Yes, of course. Following on, on the planning issue, as, as many people in this room will know, that, that the planning authority gets, as part of the, the, the process of granting planning permission to developers, they get, often get Section 106 money, I think it's called, yeah. wh which is money that's available to the, for the benefit of the wider community. It, is there a way that that money, or some of it, can be allocated towards the establishment of GP practices isn't it, in that new community? So, so absolutely. Um, uh, and John, I don't know if you want to, to come in here. You, there may be some examples where, where that's happened. Are you aware? Were you able to help us with that? Uh, John, is our, uh, John Dowell is our finance uh, 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 executive and, uh, and may be able to give us a bit more uh, detail on that. Okay. So, evening, everyone. Uh, as Paul said, John Dowell, I'm the Director of Finance. I've also got a responsibility for estates working with our provider colleagues uh, across the system so that the um, mechanism that a gentleman talked about, section 106, uh, is there for public service to make a bid alongside any sort of development that's there. One of the things that we're doing, and I think we'll get advantage from as working more closely together as a system, is looking at the various different parts of the service about how we respond as a single NHS bid to put in um, a more coherent ask against that section 106 um, availability. So it is a sort of competitive environment where we will be having to set that off against perhaps some other public services, but what we can definitely do is make ourselves easier to engage with as a single NHS service and try and get a, a slightly larger slice of the cake. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks. I'm going to take a question that's come in online because I think it, it's, it's in a similar sort of theme and I know I touched on it and the question is what difference will it make CCGs taking on primary care and when will patients see the benefit? So as I, as I said we've taken over the commissioning of primary care um, I think there are two key benefits that I would pick up. The first is that primary care is now being commissioned by an organisation that knows about primary care in Devon. Um, our governing body has uh, five GPs who work throughout Devon. I'm one of them and a couple of my GP colleagues uh, um, are here uh, in the room with me. Uh, and, and so we bring a, a real knowledge of, of what it's like um, working as a GP in Devon, what are the needs of primary care so that we can continue to deliver the services that we need, what are the pressures within primary care and what are the needs of our population. And I think when NHS England, who do it on a much bigger region, um, were commissioning primary care, they didn't have that local experience, that local knowledge. So I think that is, that is definitely a positive. And I think the second positive is that 
um, when we look at how we look after our patients, and, and, and we picked up earlier about that relationship between primary and secondary care, um, uh, we've spent a lot of time uh, over the last months and years talking about actually the best place for someone to be when they are unwell may not be in hospital. It may be at home getting the support and care that they need, and part of that support and care may be with their GP as well as the support from secondary care to be able to do that. And if we think that's the case, then the old fashioned way of funding this particular organization and that particular organization in a clear line as to who is what responsibility becomes much more difficult. And it means that that then makes it less, less easy, less, less doable for us to have people at home and supported at home. So the fact that we commission both of those services means that we can blur the lines a lot more, still supporting each of those organisations, but blurring the lines in the way that we commission it so that patients can feel that they're getting the support they need uh, in the right places. So I think those are the two key things. Um, uh, the question about um, when, uh, when will patients see the benefits, there's so much happening in general practice that we have to support our GP colleagues with. And I think we've seen some benefits in general practice in our relationship with them. We've been key in getting that digital enablement within general practice that you're all benefiting from, and we will continue to do that. Um, very shortly, we will be talking to our GP colleagues in Plymouth about a prospectus that we've put together. We've only been able to do those sort of things because we're commissioning their services on how to make sure that general practice in Plymouth flourishes and is robust and continues to deliver services for the population. So, so I think some of those benefits are already coming through, but I think they will get more and more, particularly around being able to look after people where they want to be looked after. Any questions in the room? I've got a couple more online, but I'm quite happy to come to the room now. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I live in a part of Northern Devon and you will understand this question shouldn't have been addressed to you, but you'll see for obvious reasons why I'm bringing it to you rather than the North Devon District Hospital Trust. Um, the Trust had their AGM on the 5th of this month, but their CQC report wasn't published until the 12th. Now, there were five instances where they require improvement, being safe, responsive, well-led, urgent and emergency services and maternity. Bearing this in mind and the remoteness of that hospital, what are the CQC going to do to hold this to account? Okay. Right. Uh, thank you. So, so yes, CQC did go uh, into North Devon uh, District Hospital to do an inspection and that recently has been reported as, as, as you say. And it, it, in, in the narrative that's in there, they do recognise some progress. Um, so the leadership team within uh, Royal Devon and Exeter um, are in there and are supporting and providing the leadership for North Devon District Hospital at the moment. And they recognise that there have been the signs of improvement as a result of that support, but there is still a long way to go. Um, we will be doing uh, everything within our power to ensure that the, the shortfalls that the CQC have highlighted are acting on. Um, it may be helpful. I might, um, I'm going to invite my colleague Sonia Manton to come up. Uh, so Sonia is, uh, is our Director of Commissioning for that part of Devon and so we'll be much closer to the detail of that and I think that might be quite helpful. Sonia, if you don't mind, just to hear from you. Answer yeah. here, come on. Thank you. So obviously um, there's two key points. One is we work very closely with CQC to make sure that the concerns that are raised through the monitoring of the quality of those services feature in our planning and in our commissioning. So I think that's really important. And the second thing I think is worth highlighting is um, we've been talking about the, the quality and the resilience of services in North Devon for some time. And North Devon District Hospital has benefited, benefited from a relationship with the RDE more, more latterly over the last um, 
18 months or so. And that has demonstrated that actually working in partnership across the system with other providers, with us, has benefited the local population, has improved, as um, Paul mentioned, we've seen some um, improvements in the quality and the resilience of care there. And so this year we are actively working with all those partners to understand what is the future and the long-term solution um, to maintain and to improve the services for North Devon. So it is really important to us. So working with CQC and other partners in primary care, local authority and very important the rd &E as well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, if you take the microphone back to Sam, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Sonia. Um, I'm gonna, there's uh, uh, some questions. I'll come back to the room in just a moment, um, but I'll take some questions that were presented um, to us uh, uh, beforehand, and I'll take the three questions together. Again, they are from Martin Shaw, and they relate to our, um, our performance. Um, uh, and, and there are national standards that we are expected to reach uh, around how long people have to wait to access treatments such as A&E or their, ref their referrals for urgent treatment to then be seen. And Martin asks us particularly around elective surgery, um, around how long it takes for a cancer patient to see a consultant and for cancer patients to commence treatment. Um, now, in my, one of my earlier slides, I did say that we aren't doing providing services as timely, as quickly as we should do in Devon, and that's reflected in our numbers. I won't go through the figures there. I will, I'm very happy for those figures. We will provide them to the person who's asked the question, and if you would like to know those details, then, then just ask uh, afterwards and we can provide them to you. Um, but I'm not going to hide them because I'm going to say that they are nowhere near where they need to be. Um, and, um, and, and we are working with all of the trusts within Devon. We have seen their plans. Uh, we have advised them on their plans and we have tr done our best to seek that assurance that they are doing everything they can to get those under control. Um, we are making a plan that by April 2020 that we will be meeting those national targets. Uh, we're not at the moment uh, meeting them, um, but they are important. When someone is referred to a hospital because there is a concern around cancer, we should be seeing them within two weeks. Uh, and so we do need to improve it. Why it's like that? There are lots of reasons why it's like that. We have seen an increased number of referrals. There are more people needing to access those services. Recently, uh, NICE, who set out their guidelines, changed the criteria for referral for two-week waits in order to try and pick up many more people with early cancer. And that means that we are screening a lot more people through that process. Uh, the hope is that actually we will detect more people with treatable cancers than finding them late when we don't necessarily have those curative treatments available to us. But it does mean that we aren't keeping up with that increased uh, referrals that are coming through to us. So that's one of the many reasons it's, it's not one that we should hold on to and use as an excuse. It's one that we should work around and think that we actually need to meet that challenge. And that's one of our responsibilities as a, CC, as a CCG. Uh, Gentlemen in the room, you had your hand raised. Thank you very much. Um, I'm returning to Holsworthy Hospital in that area. Now, Holsworthy Hospital was the remotest uh, hospital with inpatient beds. It temporarily had those beds closed uh, a couple of years ago. And the... Um, Holsworthy community uh, team are working very closely with the community to try and reopen those beds. In fact, in the latest edition of Pulse, it says we continue to do our best to open the beds. Now, yesterday, you'll be aware that the Prime Minister got doorstepped in Leeds only less than two months into a premiership. He's reiterated there's 20.5 billion annually going towards the NHS, that's um, an additional 3% per annum up to or by 2023. Bearing in mind what those beds mean to our community, can we doorstep the Prime Minister about funding for the South West, bearing in mind the remoteness, the sparsity, the economic deprivation down here, and the increased number of elderly people who want to be close to their home. I know there are teams working closely with people in domiciliary arrangements, and we have opened three beds in a residential care home, 
but that's not the same as having a constant presence of a nurse at that person's bedside. Yeah. Okay. So could we do something about renegotiating our budget, mindful of the warm words the Prime Minister is uttering at this current time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, really good question. Um, uh, I think there are there are several aspects to us to this uh, to cover. I think um, uh, first of all, we do as a CCG, we put that case to our, to nationally to NHS England, um, uh, who are you know, and to the Department of Health around how our allocation is calculated, in order to try and secure as many fun, as much funds as we can. Because I agree with you, there are the challenges, particularly around the rurality. Of, uh, of our county um, and come, that comes with, with some, some unique challenges that, that we, we have to try and meet and what you describe in Holsworthy is, is exactly one of those. Um, the other thing is that we, are, um, we, we do have a, a, a national voice. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago I was in London. There was an all-party parliamentary group on uh, rural health and social care and I was invited to, uh, to give evidence um, and it was an opportunity for me to talk about Devon in exactly those ways, the challenges that Devon faces in trying to meet the healthcare needs of people who live in very rural and often isolated situations. Um, one of our MPs uh, is very vociferous um, around that and feels very strongly um, that, uh, that this government should do more and is actually um, uh, very vocal about that within Westminster and, and with ourselves when we meet her, that that is the case. So there is that influence going up. Um, what we can do is make sure that that is strong as possible and that our case is as plausible and as well articulated as we can. And we'll continue to do that and we have the support from our local authority colleagues and from many of our MPs in doing that. So I think that's, a, that's really strong and we'll continue to do that. Um, We've still got uh, a few minutes left. Um, I'll pick up a couple of questions um, uh, that are online. One is, what will the long-term plan actually change? Um, one of the things that we know is that carrying on doing the same thing, but do, having to do more of it because we have more people in the county who are getting older, who are living with chronic conditions that we can do more about, is not going to work because we don't have the funds available to us, we don't have the workforce available to us to be able to do that. So one of the things that the long-term pl plan lays out is you can't just keep doing, we've got to think differently. So the way we practiced medicine 10, 20 years ago isn't necessarily the way we should be practicing medicine now. And many things have changed, and many things have advanced. Some of the ways that we do things are outdated and we need to challenge them and we need to change them. And the whole idea about digital outpatients that was quoted when we were doing the review and the public engagement about the long-term plan is an example of that. So the long-term plan gives us an opportunity or challenges us probably more fairly to say what are you going to do differently that means that you can remain viable in the services that you provide. Now. Our response to the long-term plan that comes out in the autumn will say what our answers, supported by you, what we think those answers are and what we intend to do. Um, so I'm not necessarily going to preempt that. They're still in discussion. We are still trying to work out which ones of those are achievable for us uh, as organisations and for us as a county. Um, but I think what it'll do is it'll challenge us to say we be different, we work differently, we we look after people in different settings. We do outpatient uh, procedures rather than hospital procedures. We only bring people up to the hospital when absolutely necessary. We support our GPs to do much more in primary care. All of those sort of things, I hope, will be articulated within our plan. And we will start becoming a, um, you know, we will be a 21st century provider of health services, commissioner of health services uh, in our case. Sorry, you had your hand up there. And then. Uh, just going on to the question that you uh, just the information you've just presented, I've got a question. How are you actually getting the information that's outside of the NHS? So, if somebody has a good idea, for example, and would like to present it to you, who believes that we can change something and do it better and more efficiently and at less cost, how can you get that message through? Because I've written into um, the CCG twice and had no response. 
So I'm wondering how that happens. Okay. So firstly, apologies. Um, if you've written to the CCG, you should have had a response. Um, please do let me know your contact details after this, and I will look into it, and I'll find out why you haven't had that response, and I'll make sure you do. Um, contacting us is certainly one way. Um, we had that, that engagement around the long-term plan that with the help of Healthwatch, um, and that was one way in which we got those ideas from, 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 from the public. We continue to have, in fact, we've got a virtual uh, engagement. Uh, I'm just looking to see if Andrew is here. Andrew, do you want to talk about the opportunities for the public to be able to contribute ideas and information that will help us with that? Yes, thank you. That was a, a good question. Um, I mean, we... Um, sorry, Andrew, introduce yourself Yes, for me. sorry, Andrew. I'm Andrew Millward. I'm Director of Communications and Human Resources for the CCG. Um, we, there's lots of ways um, that you can engage with us uh, around ideas um, and um, taking things forward. So we've just created a, an online citizens panel, which is totally representative of the population of Devon so we have 1700 people and the idea is we can um, float ideas with them ask them questions ask them to give us ideas for things that we think are important and we've asked them about children and mental health for example um, and other ideas so um, that's one way we use um, social media a lot in terms of um, raising uh, issues and asking questions um, and so for me it's just about various ways that we can engage with people my colleagues and teams in the CCG also meet with lots of community groups right across Devon. For instance, I'm, I join the Sidmouth group, which Di um, uh, chairs. Uh, and the idea is actually if we talk a lot with local communities and local people, we, we get really good ideas um, and we really get good thoughts. And we understand actually some of the challenges and pressures. And sometimes as a CCG, we can actually do a little bit to help people. A little bit of support often goes a long way. But happy to talk to you after the um, session if that would be helpful. And if any of you want to be involved in any of that or on our panel, uh, then, then please do get in contact uh, with us um, either via uh, the Facebook uh, page or there is an email address. It's not on the screen at the moment, but we'll make sure that that's obvious for you um, as, we, as we continue the meeting. The gentleman here had his hand up for a question. Please, Sam. Thank you. I, I wanted to return to the question of the long-term plan and pick up on the point that Sonia was making about working in partnership across the system. The system already has a number of plans. Um, I think you work with three health and wellbeing partnerships that each has a health and wellbeing strategy. The STP has a long-term plan and the CCG quite rightly is going to produce its own. So there's a potential for five long-term plans for Devon. So my question is, at best, is it going to be possible to align those plans? Sorry, at worst, is it going to be possible to align them? And at best, is it possible to have one overarching plan that everybody signs up to so that we're all marching in the same direction? Um, a really good question. And I think if you had asked me that uh, two or three years ago, I would have said, at best they would be aligned. Um, where we are at the moment, so you're right, the three local authorities will have their health and wellbeing strategies that they uh, have to produce. Um, they have worked together in order to try and see the common threads there to try and align those. Um, the long-term plan response that we are creating isn't a CCG response. We are working with our providers so that it is an STP response. The STP, or the Sustainability and Transformation Partnership, is the collection of all the commissioners, which is, which is ourselves now as a single CCG, as well as the local authorities, uh, and our providers, our mental health provider, uh, Devon Partnership Trust and Live Well, our four acute hospitals who also provide community services, and, and, and our GPs and, and so on, coming together and forming that partnership. And that's what the STP is. And rather than having a commissioner long-term plan and an SDP long-term plan, we are actually just writing one. It's just as the commissioner, we are taking um, part of that leadership in that, in generating it. And so we are doing quite a lot of that coordinating with the public on how we write that. We are working with our colleagues in the providers in writing that. And also putting in there 
what do we think we should be commissioning because that's our role as a CCG. What services should be being provided? And then we work, and then our provider colleagues are coming to us and, set, and talking about how they think that these can be put together and how they can be provided. So it should be an STP long-term plan response, not one of many from us. Yeah, really good point. I've got one more question online, and then uh, we may have one or two minutes for any other final questions. Uh, uh, and uh, it is a challenge to us as a CCG, which is how are you going to make more GP points appointments available? Um, we have um, uh, a set number of GPs working uh, within Devon. Um, we have uh, a, a, you know, we have a, a public or a patient list for the, each of those surgeries where often the needs or the, or, uh, or the requirements of that population, those GPs are struggling to meet those. And that is happening in a number of areas uh, within Devon and many of you will be experiencing that. What we don't have is a resource of GPs available to fill that gap and increase the number of GPs. We also don't have a large resource of practice nurses to come in and support them and to help with the practice nurse vacancies that we have. So, so in the same way that the long-term plan challenges us to think differently about the services as a whole, we need to think differently about how we provide general practice. Because actually what you do need is you do need the care and support from your GP practice so that you are enabled, you get the medicines you require, you get the monitoring you require, and you get the help and support that you need. So we need to build around those GPs whatever is possible to give them the space to see you when they need to. And that's where things like the online consultation uh, are going to be hugely valuable, uh, where using the NHS app in order for you to be able to access some of those, some of that general practice information is going to be really helpful. To create the space so that if we can't increase the number of GP appointments, we can make sure that they are used when they really need to be used. It's almost like it's a, it's a precious resource that you need when you really need to see a GP. Uh, and we are working with our GP colleagues on the ways that we can do that. And if any of you are from Plymouth, um, I, I hope that you would take a moment to look at uh, the GP prospectus that we're putting out there because that tries to do exactly that create the space within general practice so that those appointments are available for when you really need them. Uh, and we will take all the good things that we get from that and we will see what we can do in the rest of Devon in order to try and replicate that. Um, but yes, we are working with our GPs. And again, that reflects that's an advantage of us doing the commissioning of general practice because we can have that local relationship with our GP colleagues to try and do that. We've got uh, a couple of minutes uh, left. Any one final question? Can I? Um, yes, yes. One last, we'll take these last two questions, and, and then that is, um, it may be very brief answers. Or yeah. I just want to ask a question regarding the software that the RDNEs implementing at the, this present moment. They've got lots of placards inside the hospital about MyCare, which I think is software developed by a company called Epic, uh, which is supposed to be rolled out sometime next summer. Is it something that other, uh, the other three hospitals in Devon are also doing at the same time? So the answer to that at the moment is the RDNE is is rolling out EPIC. I think there is a, a very keen interest in seeing what that actually, what that does. We've, we've got high expectations um, of, of how that digital enablement will make things uh, more efficient within the hospital and between the hospital and other organisations. Um, and, I, and I think partly we need to we need to uh, have an opportunity to experience that and 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 to gain that learning and then there are conversations between the different hospital providers uh, about about what their digital solution should be and uh, and i'm sure that will will influence it sorry brief conversation because i want to let this gentleman just come in just before we finish yes for some years now there's been this talk of integration of health and social care which i think it'd be an issue for many years but in particular in tor bay particularly interesting in Torbay because Torbay is a small unitary authority and it's only got one district general hospital, a bit easier to organise. I wonder if that had ever been written up in a uh, professional journal or as a learned paper or anything for the benefit of the rest of the country. Um, it has uh, and particularly that model where in Torbay where there has been that integration between health and social care um, 
uh, that actually a lot of other areas in the country have come down and um, talked to those key individuals who have made that happen within Torbay to, to learn about that. Um, it is in, in, in the National Journal somewhere. Where it is, I don't know, but what I'll do is I'll find out. I, I know a man who does know where, where, where that is, um, uh, and, uh, and we, can, uh, we can provide that link for you. But yes, um, there has been an interest, and I think rightly so, because it has enabled us to, to, be, you know, to achieve um, some really good things through that. Thank you. Yes. Um, we're out of time. Um, I would like to thank everyone who has uh, joined us online, uh, everyone who has contributed with questions or comments, everyone who's come here uh, to Sandy Park uh, to see, to, to, to be part of this and to be involved. I would really encourage you to continue that active involvement. Your, your voice, your wisdom, your contributions, your experience are hugely valuable uh, for us so that we can make sure that we do do the right thing uh, for you when we try and commission our services. Uh, so thank you for joining me. Uh, uh, I've enjoyed this time with you. I've enjoyed celebrating um, what the health system has done here in Devon over the last, uh, well, over the last six years, uh, really. And I look forward to the excitement of continuing that. So thank you, everyone.